I decided to uh, take a detour from Stillwell on the topic of quadratic reciprocity and instead try to follow um, Joseph Silverman's excellent little book, um, A Friendly Introduction to Number Theory. Right? I give you guys his section on Pell's equation the other time. Um, he's actually got three chapters. His, his chapters are short. So he has three chapters which are on uh, quadratic reciprocity. And so what I'm going to try to do is hit the high points of these three chapters and um, uh, skip the more tedious and lengthy proofs and just try to prove the things that are kind of um, lower hanging fruit enough so that the, the main thing is I want you to leave this lecture with a clear understanding of what on earth quadratic, quadratic reciprocity is. Because I think if you, if you found yourself, if you, if you dive into the middle of this material and just try to understand it from the middle, it's hopeless. Uh, it's just a bunch of jargon, all right? So we have to start at the start. And so this is his um, chapter 20. And so he just starts with some numerics and um, basically the question, which is reciprocity. Um, so we, we, we before have talked about how to solve AX congruent to C mod, you know, mod M, whatever. We've, we've talked about how to solve things like that, you know. Um, linear congruences, if you will. But um, he says, the, quadra the, quadra the problem of quadratic reciprocity, it concerns questions more like this. All right, so here's the kind of questions we want to answer. Is three um, congruent is three congruent to the square um, of some number mod seven. All right, that's one of the kind of questions. Or here's another one. Does uh, the congruence x congruent to minus one mod 13 have a solution? That's another question that would be an example of a quadratic congruence question, right? Um, or here's another kind of question that would be in, similar, similar, in a similar vein. For which primes for which primes p does x congruent to 2, rather x squared congruent to 2 um, mod p have solution? Right, so all of these are questions which involve congruence, right, and a square. Okay, do you see that? So that's what the, that's one of the distinctions here between the problems we solved mostly looked at before, which were what, um, in terms of just straight congruence equations, we looked at like linear congruence or a system of them with the Chinese remainder theorem, right? And um, he says, okay, so we can answer the first two questions right now to see if three is congruent to the square of some, some number mod seven. What do you do? Right, let me, I'll call this uh, A, B, and C for the sake of reference. So to, to solve A, what do we do? We just go, oh, um, well, how about this? So we got zero, zero squared, one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, that's all you got to look at, mod 7, right? Um, actually, I'm writing 3 equals, but I could just as well write 2 because I'm just going to straight write equals. I mean, this is 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, right? But if you reduce those mod 7, what do you got? Um, well, 0, 1, 4, 2, uh, 2, 4, and that's 1 because 35 plus 1 is 36. So what's the answer to question A? Is 3 congruent to the square of some number mod 7? No. no, because we don't see 3 in this list of all the possible squares, right? So the answer to the question posed in A is... Nope. There does not exist x um, in the integers such that um, 
x squared is congruent to 3 mod 7. Okay, so sometimes the question is amenable to just straight checking things by cases, right? Fine. In fact, I think that's probably true of many of the questions we'll ask today. But what we're going to see is that, that there's a technology which allows you to answer a wide variety of questions um, in terms of congruence uh, to a square using some really, really slick um, theorems. All right, so um, yeah, yeah. now um, what he says is, what else he say? He says, uh, in similar fashion, if you square all the numbers from 0 to 10 and reduce mod 13, what you'll find is, and I'm, I won't actually do that, he just points out to the, the answer to part B is like, okay, so this one, um, x congruent to 5, and, and uh, x congruent to 8, solve it. Right? Because if you square 5, you get 25. 25 is 1 less than 26, which means it's congruent to minus 1 mod 13. And uh, the square of 8 is 24, excuse me, 64. And 64 is 1 less than 65, which is, which is enough to show that it's congruent to minus 1 mod 13. All right, so. Um, all right. And um, I don't think he actually addresses C just yet. We'll come back to that, I suppose. Um, he says, okay, so before we can even uh, really say much more than anything else, maybe we should start looking at some tables of values to gain a sense of the patterns that are going on here. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow his lead and like write these tables out, see what we can see. All right, so um, I think for the sake of um, organization, I need to erase that, though, before I foolishly try to write. We've done calculations like this before, right? Yeah. So here we go. Here is a list of b and uh, b squared. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Again, b and b squared. So this first one's mod, mod 5. Second one, we're going to do mod 7. And then up next, mod 11. Um, no. I know. I know. He says, we can answer the first two questions right now. He doesn't come out and say, and I'll eventually answer the third question, but that's the truth. So it is, it's kind of like, hey, wait a minute. You didn't answer the, hmm. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so what did I say? Mod 11. Oh, no, the cough. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10. Should have spaced those out better. Oh, well. And 13. 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is one of the strengths, by the way, of this book by Silverman, is he really does have a lot of these sort of numerical um, interludes, which really help. Those are not, you know, it's not just a teaching device or something. That's actually how number theorists in practice work sometimes. Um, they look at a lot of data, and they look for patterns. That's what they do. At least a certain kind of number theorist. There's others that are more up in the clouds, I suppose. Um, all right, so you guys tell me zero squared. You 
a change of pace here. I'm going to go to red. So we got uh, 0, 1, 4, 9. But 9 is congruent to what? 4, right? 16. What's 16 congruent to? 1, right? Mod 5. How about this one? Mod 7. So we got 0, 1 squared, 1, 2 squared, 4. 3 squared, 9. 9 is 2. Uh, 4 squared, 2. Thank you. 5 squared, 24. <laughs> 5 squared is 24. I'm everything that's wrong in the world. Oh, is it 4? Yes, 4. Thank you. Um, 6 squared, 36. That's 1 mod 7. Uh, got 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, mod 11, 5, yeah. Um, 25 mod 11 is 4. Um, 36 mod 11 is 3. 49 mod 11 is 5. 64 mod 11 is minus 2, which is 9. Uh, 81 mod 11 is 4. 100 mod 11 is 1, because 99 plus 1 is um, It should be three. I was about, thank you. I was about to check my answers here. But you're right. All right, so I'm going to just, so this one works out to zero, one, four, nine, three, twelve, ten. All right, ten, twelve, three, nine, four, one, mod thirteen, right? All right, so what can we what can we see from all this? Are there any patterns that stick out to you guys in terms of the relation between you know what what do squares look like mod mod and odd prime? There's a symmetry. Ah, so like this one four four one, this one four two two four one. This one four nine five three three five nine four one. Oh yeah, very nice. One four nine three twelve ten, and then ten twelve three four nine four. Yeah, just the same. Always that zero at the start, but of course that's kind of an outlier. Yeah. Oh, oh if, I, if I yeah okay, that's true. Yeah. Um, right. He says, um, he says, each number other than zero appears as a square exactly twice. You know, e each number that, that does appear as a square appears twice, right? Except for zero, of course. Um, hmm. He says, how can we describe, how can we describe this pattern with a formula? All right. And, um, so he, he, he turns this into a theorem, right? This is all kind of a warm-up um, for the actual thing, so I probably should move past this. But his theorem is this theorem, you know, let P be an odd prime. All right, then... Um, there exists exactly p minus 1 over 2 quadratic residues, quadratic residues mod p, and Exactly P minus one over two non residues mod P. 
All right. So what is what's this what's this term quadratic residue mean? What's that? Do you understand that language? So not exactly right. So quadratic residue, which we'll also call a QR, a non-residue, we'll also call an NR. So just to have, because we don't want to keep writing those long words out. But um, so the thing is, guys, if we look at Z mod NZ, this is the set of, of residues modulo N. That's another language for that. So the residues are the remainders, actually. So this is another language for that. So when we say a quadratic residue, we're talking about the remainder of a square. Um, right? So the remainder, like this one, is saying, is the remainder of some square equal to minus 1? Uh, let's see if I just see here. Um, so these are the quadratic residues because they're the remainders of the square of B. So the reason we say quadratic is because it's a square and residue because it's a remainder. Okay. Well, that's, that's it. Quadratic residue. All right. And um, the proof of this theorem is actually kind of fun. The um, and the, I think the heart of it is actually something that's um, worth talking about for a minute. So if you take p minus b and you square it, what do you get? You get p squared minus two pb, right? Plus b squared, right? That's congruent to what? That is congruent to b squared mod p, right? Because the first two, terms, first, two, first two terms are multiples of p. So if we look at the quadratic residues mod p, what are we looking at? We're looking at, you know, non-zero. Non I think I was supposed to say non-zero. I missed the word non-zero in here somewhere, guys. No? Well? Oh, maybe that's an assumption. Ah, my bad. My bad. So this is a little bit, just a little bit more, like not, not a QR. So it, 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 uh, the QR has to be a non-zero square, the, the, um, the remainder of a non-zero square quadratic residue. So we, do, we throw out zero for QR, OK? And um, we also throw out zero for NR. So zero is not part of the discussion. So look at the, the quadratic residues mod P. You've got what? You've got 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared all the way out to p squared, right? Excuse me, all the way out to not p squared, but p minus, p is zero, right? In this story, we're working mod p, p minus one squared, right? But what is this identity I have written right above show? It shows you that if you look at one squared, two squared, all the way out to p minus one over two squared, right? That list is equal to what? Like, apply what I've written above to that list. What do you got? See this? 1 squared is congruent to p minus 1 squared. See that? Right? And 2 squared is congruent to p minus 2 squared. And p minus 1 over 2 squared is congruent to what? p 
minus P minus 1 over 2, also known as <laughs> P minus 1 over 2 squared, right? So what does this show you? Ooh. Now, I'm going to skip the rest of the proof. The more difficult part of the proof is what? So this, this shows you that in principle, there are p minus 1 over 2 squares, right? Excuse me, what does this show? This shows there are at most p minus 1 over 2 squared quadratic residues for mod p and odd prime, right? What could happen? It could so happen, in principle, that these two guys could be the same, right? That's what the second half of the proof goes to show, is that, in fact, this is a distinct list. Um, you know, is that the right way to say it? I, don't, I, can't, I don't think I can say it's a distinct list. Can I say that? 1, 4, 9, 5, 3. I do. I, I can say that, can't I? Well, I better be able to say that. That's what the theorem says. <laughs> so you can prove that that's, in fact, a distinct list. Um, okay. So looking at the residues, the second one, you're cutting the amount of residues in half mm -hmm. by definition. Right. So but what does that show us? Inside the list of half. What I'm saying is that this, this identity shows that there are at most this many of them, right, which is p minus 1 over 2 by counting. But what I'm saying is, in principle, there could still be some redundancy to still narrow that list. Okay. Now, the numerical evidence over here says, eh, probably not. The theorem claims not, right? But that's not a, you can't use the theorem to prove the theorem. <laughs> not in these, well, anyway, not usually. Um, and then, okay, so if it's, anyway, so if you have a, um, a square and, um, excuse me, if you have a, um, oh, I get what you're saying. Okay. So what's, what's a non-residue is the question really. Yeah. What is a non-residue? Here's what he says. A number that is not congruent to a square mod P is called a non-residue. So, okay, let's, let's be, let's be specific here. What are the non-residues of five? Yep, two and three. Yeah, the non-residue, again, refers to non-zero. So the non-residues for five are two and three. The non-residues for seven. Three again, right? Three, five, what do you say, six? How many residues were there? Three, right? There's a... All right, this is not an accident. And so he, so he, um, so anyway, yeah. I think once you've proved that there are exactly, once you have proved that there are exactly P minus 1 over 2 quadratic residues, it then follows immediately from counting that they're the, the same number of non-residues. But, all right, so I was going to try not to prove anything too much here. I should move on. The main point of this was to ingrain in you an understanding of what we mean by quadratic residue and not quadratic residue. I hope I've accomplished that so far. What makes three, five, and six not uh, non-residue versus two? They're not here, which shows that there is no number which squares okay, so I to be you. three, five, or six mod mod seven. Uh, <laughs> Right. Yeah, we've we've not we've not we've not proved it in general, but we've proved it for we have proved it for five, seven, eleven, and thirteen. So we're we are missing infinitely many cases. Um, if you'd like to see the proof, it is on page one hundred forty-four of Silverman. Um, 
I'll try to make you guys a scan of these three chapters and send it to you for your records, you know. Yep, yep. It'll take me a little bit. And it's going to be a little bit tilted because... And I can't, it's just such a love, love, wonderfully bound book. I can't bring myself to just cut the pages out. Oh, yeah? Ah. <laughs> you need not be named, huh? All right, so... Um, like I said, that's just that's not the whole proof. That's just the the I think the interesting part of the proof for me, which for me interesting means easy. Um, so um, <laughs> the next question you ask, like, what happens when you multiply a QR by an NR, right? What does that happen? That's congruent to what, right? It's mod p. This is the question he asks, and. So how about this? 2 times 5 is congruent to 3 mod 7. 5 times 6 is congruent to 8 mod 11. Um, 4 times, man, I don't approve of this. It's using the multiplication symbol. Ah, oh, so tacky. Um, 4 times 5 congruent to 7. Wish we could fix that. Mod 13. It's an unfortunate use. Um, 10 times 7. Oh, well, I'll just stick with it. Times 7 congruent to 5. Mod 13. Right? And what happens if we do not a residue times not a residue? What happens then? Um, we got 3 times 5 congruent to... 1 mod 7, um, 6 times 7, congruent to 9 mod 11, 5 times 11, congruent to, my 11 became 111, I don't advise that, 3 mod 13, and 7 times 11, congruent to 12, mod 13. All right. So um, what's the, what is the pattern? Do you see? I'll put the, I'll put the decision to the, to the right. So we, we just need to look over here, right? Um, mod seven. So we got three. Is three a quadratic residue? No, sir, it's a not, not a quadratic residue. So the answer, mm, not a residue. Um, so in this case, QR times NR give NR. How about eight? Is eight a quadratic residue mod 11? Nope, so NR. And likewise, the next two, they're also not residues. So it looks like if we have a quadratic residue times a non residue, we get a non-residue again, right? And how about non-residue times non-residue? Well, 3 times 5 mod 7. See, 3 and 5 are non-residues, but when you multiply them together, you get what? You get 1. Is 1 a quadratic residue mod 7? It is. So this is a QR. Um, is 9 a quadratic residue mod 11? Yep, it is. And in fact, all four of these, if you just look at the data over there, you see, you see that. So he points out, Silverman that is, he points out that we have the following patterns. In fact, you could write this. Essentially, QR times QR is, again, a, a QR, although that hasn't been demonstrated in this table, right? Um, <coughs> yeah, excuse me. Although he says this, this you can argue algebraically. Maybe you could think about that. Do you think about how to argue that algebraically? Let's actually go through that. That's actually an interesting calculation. We should do that. What does it mean for it to be a quadratic residue? That means it's a square of a number, right? So if you just think about what this means symbolically. Oh, no, no. Yes. So it's, it, this is like x squared yeah, y squared. 
times y squared, which is congruent to xy squared mod v. So yeah, of course the product of quadratic residues is a quadratic residue. No, no, you're, no, that's wrong, you don't want to be right. Wait a minute, no, that's wrong. It's the wrong saying. Let's see here, this is a silly place, let us move on. Um, it's kind of like a negative sign. Ah, it's kind of like a negative sign. That is a very, yeah. um, very wise comment. It is kind of like, a, so here's the reason. Uh, you're exactly right, and so this brings us to the introduction of the Legendre symbol. All right, so here we go, which I'm going to write over here. <laughs> yeah, the Legendre symbol. The Legendre symbol is this. We do A over P. That's not a fraction. It's a case-wise defined function. It's either one if A is a quadratic residue mod P, and it's minus one if A is a non-residue mod P. All right, this is the quadratic, this is the symbol that we're going to use to compactly and elegantly describe, describe quadratic reciprocity. All right. And so what we have shown thus far, um, although we haven't proved it, right, but we've numerically waved our hands at it at least, right, is what? What is this saying? Well, see, if you look at it, what it's saying is we have a theorem, which is that A over B times B, listen to me, P times B over P is equal to AB over P. Think through the cases, right? You either got 1 times minus 1 or minus 1 times 1 or minus 1 times minus 1. The 1 times minus 1 or the minus 1 times 1, that's the case of not a, not, a not, a, not a residue times quadratic residue or vice versa. As we've seen, um, you know, at least some of the data indicates that that's true. And um, if we have a non-residue times a non-residue, we do, in fact, get a quadratic residue from the data. Haven't proved it yet. The only thing we've actually proved is the theorem in the case that they're both quadratic residues. It checks. But this theory, this, this symbol allows us to incorporate all three of these observations in a formula based on minus one and one. So like, if this is not a residue and that's not a residue, the Legendre symbol is minus one for both. So minus one times minus one gives me plus one, which means that this is a quadratic residue, just as we are observing over here, for example. Now, um, oh, he, and here let's let's look at a, a specific example. He has a he has a pretty nice example here that I'm going to steal. So he's like, okay, so let's calculate the quadratic reciprocity of 75 mod 97. In other words, is 75 the square of some number mod 97? This is definitely not something we want to use the uh, table of values thing to do, right? Um, so he's like, well, by this theorem up here, we can do what? We can do, um, yeah, we can split it up. This is 3 times 5 times 5 over 97. And again, this is not a fraction. <laughs> right, so this, then we got to figure out what's 3. Well, the thing that's cool here, check this out, right? You got to figure out is 5 is 5 and 3, are those um, quadratic residues? Well, the thing is you don't actually have to figure out 3 and 5. Why? 
why don't you have to figure out both? Check it out, right? <laughs> Look at this. Got two of them, right? They're either both one or they're both minus one. Anyway, you, <laughs> anyway you slice it, this product goes to one. So we just have to figure out three. Um, is it a quadratic residue mod 97? At this point, he pulls a rabbit from his hat. And he goes, ah, well, 10 squared is 100, which is congruent to 3 mod 97. So this is equal to 1. I know, right? It takes getting used to. So we have to think what the symbol means. This is asking you the question, does there exist a number whose square is congruent to 3 mod 97? What I've written in purple shows yes. 10 squared is 100. 100 is congruent to 3 mod 97. That shows that 3 is the square, is the residue of a square. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh huh. Let's see here. So I am just going to go ahead now, and um, you know he builds this up. I'm basically skipping one of his chapters. I just want to get straight to it. I want to make sure I don't get to the end of class and finally say the interesting thing. So um, again, this is built up in stages. In in his text, yeah. That, that. I'll do better. I'll do better. What the, yeah? Go ahead. Is there a, an X, let's say, there, such that what? X squared is congruent to 75 mod 97. That's what that literally means. Okay. Well, it doesn't literally mean that. It, it, it says, it says, is there an x such that that? And then, if so, equals 1, right? If not, equals minus 1. Because it's a case-wise defined function. So the genre symbol either goes to 1 or to minus 1. But <clears throat> now, so again, I, if I had devoted two days of class time to this, I, um, I, I would have time to, to, to kind of meander through the other chapter and um, somewhat justify what I'm about to write. But I'm just going to get straight to it so we can do a couple of non-trivial examples together. And then I'll talk about the history for a bit. <sighs> All right, so here we go. This is the law of quadratic reciprocity. Theorem, and I, again, I, I plan to scan the chapter that I kind of skipped. So if you if you do get interested in it, you can, you know, dig into it. Law of reciprocity, quadratic reciprocity. Do we have laws of mathematics? Uh. You know, when this, when this, was, when this uh, phrase was coined, I think a lot of things were being called laws at the time. Law of gravity, law of... <laughs> um, okay, here it is. Let P and Q be distinct 
odd primes. All right. First of all, minus one. Uh, so minus one is a. Well, I don't know how to read this. Minus one over p. Let's just say that the Legendre symbol is equal to one if p is congruent to one mod four and minus one if p is congruent to three mod four. This is actually a little bit unsurprising if you kind of think, well, let me get through the statement of the theorem and then I'll talk about why I don't think this is that surprising for us. Two over p, right? You got one if p is congruent to one or seven mod eight and minus one if p is congruent to three or five mod eight. All right, and then finally, this one will kind of blow your mind a little bit. This is actually this is actually what makes the computation with Legendre symbols far more sneaky than our previous example. I mean, our previous example had some wonderfully fortunate happen happenings in it, you know? But check this out. <laughs> Look at this. So it's, it's equal. To, notice the juxtaposition of P and Q here, guys. You can just flip them. You can just flip them. If P is congruent, to one mod four or Q is congruent to one mod four. So if either one of them is congruent to one mod four, free license to go flippy floppy. However, it's minus P over Q. So still flip flop, but just a minus, right? Which completely changes the outcome, right? But, um, and this is if P is congruent to three mod four. And what do you have to logically put here? If you look about these, these are, it's bad form to write cases which overlap with different, different answers if you're describing a function, right? So what, what logically do we have to put there? No, no. Like this had an or. Should I put an or here? Oh, no. no, it has to it has to be and, right? So, and that those are your only. Um, it's supposed to be three. I'm an idiot. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. I know. Now, yeah, I, I see why you guys are confused. Sorry. Um, now, this is it works. Um, Now, yeah. Um, so answer the question that was the part C is the answer is given here. It turns out that two is a, two is a square, two is a quadratic residue. Um, <coughs> a few pages really, but um, two is a quadratic residue mod P. Um, P is congruent to one or seven mod eight. Now think about this. So the first one really is asking, let me, let me restate this more formally. So we're, we're saying minus, is minus one congruent to x squared mod t, right? So another way to look at that, x squared plus one is congruent to zero mod p, right? Which is really saying what? It's really saying something like x squared plus 1 equals to p. 
right? Well, it's a multiple of p, right? But, I mean, if you just look at this, just forget the multiple for a second here, use my fuzzy logic, not technically fuzzy logic, but sloppy logic, really. Gaussian integers, right? When could you have the sum of squares match a prime? Right, but what kind of prime allowed that? 13 right, 13, right? Is those which were congruent to one mod four. So that, that's why I say this isn't too surprising. That, I mean, to me, this result and that result from the Gaussian integers, they've gotta be pretty strongly coupled. Um, again, you know, I, I, I've not proved everything in here for you or anything like that. Okay, so let's try to do some examples. Now that we know the theorem, um, well, know the theorem, we haven't proved it. Um, uh, here's what he says. He says, we have proven the law of quadratic reciprocity for minus one over P and two over P. And he said, and there are many different, many different proofs of the relationship between Q over P and P over Q, um, but none, are, none of them are easy. He says he gives a proof due to Eisenstein in the next chapter. Uh, I don't plan to copy that for you. Um, <laughs> unless you really want me to. Um, so, um, and he says Euler and Lagrange were the first to formulate the law of quadratic reciprocity. Um, so the Euler is, you know, 18th century. Lagrange is the end of the 18th century, right? Um, he says, but it remained for Gauss to give the first proof in his famous monograph, Disquisitions Arithmetic. Arithmetic. I'm saying that horribly wrong. But anyway, in 1801, when, you know, Gauss was about your age. 19, yeah. Um, and during his lifetime, he found seven different proofs of quadratic reciprocity. So, the mathematicians in the 19th century subsequently formulated proof, sub, sub formulated and proved cubic and quartic reciprocity laws. Whew, man, imagine that. And these, in turn, were subsumed, in, subsumed into class field theory, all right, developed by Hilbert, uh, David Hilbert, Emil Arden, and others from about 1890 to the 1920s or 30s. Uh, then, in the 1960s or 70s, a number of mathematicians formulated a series of conjectures that vastly generalized class field theory that today go under the name of Langland's program. Um, and so the fundamental theorem um, proved by Andrew Wiles in 1995 was a small piece of the Langland's program, yet it sufficed to solve Fermat's 350-year-old last theorem. So these things are all together um, more than we, than we realize. Anyway, um, <clears throat> some examples. Here we go. So let's, let's work on it. 14 over 37. So the first thing he does is just, well, that's 2. Right? Oh, this is 137. It's like, well, that's too easy. There, 137. That, that's worse, right? 7 over 30, 137. All right. So that's just the, the QR multiplication rule. Then what? Um, All right, so we look at the uh, look at the big theorem. What do we got about two? Two over p is one if p is congruent to one or seven. So how about this? What's one hundred thirty-seven divided by eight? Got yourself one. You got yourself a fifty-seven. So seven, right? Fifty-six. The remainder is one. So that says 137 is congruent to 1 mod 8, right? So what is 
2 over 137 is just equal to 1, right? So we can replace this with 7. We just, we just have that, right? The other one's 1. Now what? Can we flip-flop it? See, flip-flopping it would be ever so lovely because then we would be asking about a mod 7 question rather than a mod 137 question, right? So what's the deal here? Is either one of those congruent to 1 mod 4? Well, 7 isn't. 7 is congruent to 3 mod 4. 137, though, I think 136 is a multiple. 136 is a multiple of 4 because it's 16 more than 120. So 23 times 4, I think, is 136. Is that right? So if 136 is 23 times 4, notice that 136 um, is 4 times 23, 20, what, that feels wrong. So I'm not, I want 4, I want, I want, I want 33, 33, because that's 120, it's still wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I just, there we go. That's 120 plus 16. So there we go. Right, anyway, the, the key here is, however you want to see it or not see it, 137 is congruent to 1 mod 4. All right? And so therefore this is equal to 137 over 7. Like we can replace this question with that question, which is very nice. Um, so we're using that last bit that we're saying. Yeah, we're using this, this one. Use that one. All right. And then it's always the case that when you're looking at a question that's mod a prime, you can reduce the number that the question is based on mod prime. So we can reduce 137 modulo 4. <laughs> modulo 4. Good. Grief man, mod 7. What's 137 congruent to mod 7? I would say minus 3 mod 7. The reason I say that is because that's the easy thing for me to think about. 140, 140 is 20 times 7. It's 3 less than that. That makes it congruent to minus 3. That's my thinking. But I think you said 4. So it's congruent to 4. So we have now 4. And if I hadn't erased those tables. Oh, I know. Uh, I didn't write it down. Hold on. What do you think? I can remember the pattern. What is it for mod 7? 4 is a square. Is oh, he's like, he's like, well. Well, 4 is equal to 2 squared, so it's a QR, right? Which is to say that this is equal to 1. You always got a 50-50 chance of getting these right. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. If I gave, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, if this, maybe a student put 0 there just to like... Just make me a. Uh, I just love when people say everything's 50 50 chance to see what happens with the government. <laughs> <coughs> you know, I, I think we were, we were, I were in like, when Sunday school was like home group church thing, and the question was like, what do you think the odds are that like 
the uh, the apostles, like this young group of inexperienced fishermen, would change the world. And I'm just like, 100%. It already happened. Like it's asking, it's like asking me the question, what do you think the chances are that you're going to have four boys and a girl? I'd be like, 100%. You're you're asking, you're not asking me about a hypothetical. There's this thing called conditional probability. And when all the conditions have already been met, there's no probability question. It's 100%. <laughs> What's probability that we're <laughs> Okay, I, I, I like to continue working here. Can I erase this one? I got another one. I, I, I like This is such a weird foreign world of calcul. I've never done any other calculation even remotely like this. Like... It's such a, it is really a, a really bizarre game to play, isn't it? Uh, so we'll do this one. He's like, I'll start by doing 5 over 179, 11, yeah. All right. And this is one. Uh, uh, what was? Eleven over one seventy-nine. He does one seventy-nine over five. Um, well, five is congruent to one mod four, so you can flip that one. But this one, uh, that's eleven is congruent to three mod four, and I think that's also congruent to three mod four. I could be wrong. <coughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes. So eleven times eleven is one sixty nine plus another eleven would be one eighty. One eighty to one seventy nine. So the remainder upon division by four of uh, one seventy nine is three. So both the both this and that. I don't have names for them. <laughs> the top and the bottom. There we go. Serve me well for fractions. It'll work well here. Um, these are both congruent to 3 mod 4. So that means this guy, according to the, th the third and weird part of the quadratic reciprocity rule, is... Mm, you know, minus 1 times 179 over 11, yeah? But then, of course, we can reduce both of those mod. We can reduce mod 5, we can reduce mod 11. What do we get? I'm bring the minus out front. Minus. I still think 179 mod 11 is 1. Oh, you may well be right. Um, Whoa, 160, no, 11 squared is 121. 13, 13, yeah. 121, well, let me try again then. <laughs> I'll do this one. This one's 4 over 5. Haha, <laughs> you should have chose that one. That one's easier. <laughs> I will beat you with my school method arithmetic. Your time is waning, sir. Ha, ah, the school method has, has beat you. <laughs> Doing your common core figuring. Worthless. Ha, 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, I, I, I know. But what you're doing is like what the common core is advocating. It's instead of calculating directly with the algorithm, you're breaking it into sub-questions that involve distributive property and familiar numbers and such, and just number sense. There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's just everyone should understand that there is an algorithm that we can fall back on, and it's efficient and reliable. And it does require paper, though, So, at least for me, or uh, that. But I, I get three. Did you get three? <laughs> 